to this online conference. I'm very happy that already many people joined us, more, more than 160 person. Uh, I just make a short introduction, some uh, short minutes, uh, some minutes, and I introduce the, the speakers of our panel. So since February 24, the Russian army has been waging a war of occupation against the Ukraine. However, the resistance of the Ukrainian army and population is surprisingly strong. The Russian troops have neither been able to occupy the country nor to overthrow the government. They are bombing residential areas and vital infrastructure. Tens of thousands, tens of thousands of people have already died. At the same time, the governments in Europe are using this war of aggression as an opportunity to systematically push ahead their already previously planned rearmament, rearmament projects. But however, large sections of the left in Europe are confused in this situation. They traditionally see the, the NATO led by the US as the only imperialist power, the usual aggressor. This assessment is now wrong. It's no longer valid. We live in a multipolar world with several imperialist centers and their allies rivaling for economic and geopolitical influence in the world. So contrary to leftist mythology, Russia has been pursuing a decidedly aggressive and expansionist strategy already for many years. Putin himself has openly stated several times since uh, 2014 that he denies the existence of Ukraine. Immediately before starting the war, Putin once again made his position very clear. And yesterday, the Russian state news agency, Rio Novosti, published a guest article in which the author, Timofey Sergeyev, called for the destruction of the Ukraine as a state and under the heading of denazification. Uh, he furthermore, he calls for a punishing punishing and killing such as tens of thousands of people who participate in the defense of Ukraine during the war. So the, this perspective is very clear. It's just the destruction of, uh, of the state, of the society and part of the population. So thus, there is a great urgency for solidarity. We are organizing this event to give socialists in the Ukraine and in Russia the opportunity to put forward the views of, for discussion. We stand in solidarity with the double struggle against the Russian occupation forces and the struggle for democratic rights, for social liberation and ecological transformation against the oligarchs and the governments in the Ukraine and in Russia. We explicitly say that the people of Ukraine has the right, have the right to defend themselves against the invasion, and it's up to them to decide how to do, how best to do so. Especially in view of the mass bombings and the arbitrary shooting of people and the open threat of extermination, the armed resistance is justified and deserves our support. We stand in solidarity with this struggle. And of course, we also stand in solidarity with the Russian anti-war movement and the Russian socialist organizations against the authoritarian Putin regime, which is turning into an open dictatorship. So with this event, we want to advance the discussion in the anti-war movement, in the climate movement, and among socialists. We want to contribute to coming out of indifference. We want to contribute to building practical solidarity with this discussion. So our speakers, I welcome our speakers. First, I welcome Denis Pilash. He is a political scientist, historian, activist with the democratic socialist organization Sozialny Ruch, social movement. And he is a editor of the Commons Journal of Social Criticism. 
Then, uh, just uh, spontaneously, Maxim joined us. He is also an activist of, uh, as far as I know, for, from Social Ruk, social movement, and he will add some further elements from the concrete situation in, um, in the Ukraine. Then we have Hanna Perekoda. She is from Donetsk, from the eastern part of the Ukraine. She is a political scientist at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. And she is a member of the eco-socialist eco organization Solidarité. And she uh, is activist of the Committee Ukraine Switzerland. Finally, I welcome Silber Ashka. He is a professor at SOAS, School of Oriental and African Studies in London. He is author of several books on imperialism, on the new Cold War, and the revolutions in the Arab countries. He recently provoked a controversial debate among the left in Europe and the US in openly defending the delivery of arms for defending the Ukrainian population and uh, the independence. So each speaker will make a short introduction of about 12 minutes. After this introductory part, each speaker is welcome to comment other speakers' introductions and add some further, further elements of, for the debate. And in the last part of, a, let's say, among, uh, around 40 minutes, uh, the last part will be devoted to the discussion and exchange with you, the audience, the public, Via, via the question and answer or Fragen und Antwort, question and answer function of Zoom. So you can just put your questions or your statements in uh, questions and answer. And some comrades, uh, Philippe, uh, Eva and me, we will collect this, put together and put uh, the questions or uh, contributions to the floor. So, uh, Finally, I wish you all a, fruit, a fruitful and productive discussion. And I already uh, express a big thank to all uh, translators, interpreters. We have made an effort to translate from English in German, in French, in Italian. And I welcome also the comrades from Spain, from the journal Viento Sur, who um, which joined us and uh, they will translate the uh, intervention into Spanish. So the meeting, the conference is organized by the relaunched Journal of Emancipation, supported and co-organized by the Swiss Movement for Socialism. And as I just mentioned, also uh, 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 supported uh, endorsed by the Spanish journal uh, Viento Sur. So I just um, give uh, Dennis Pilas uh, the opportunity to start and to give us a, a concrete picture of the situation in the Ukraine. Thank you. So we are now and after 40 days of a full-scale Russian invasion against Ukraine. Uh, and while this is a result of a unilateral aggression by the right-wing dictatorship in Russia, that has already uh, led to deaths of uh, tens of thousands of people and the lives of tens of millions of people have been broken. So many had to flee their homes. Many millions have crossed the, the borders of Ukraine to other European states. And many, many more millions had to relocate uh, inside Ukraine to more safer cities and regions, though actually no region is safe completely and the Russian missile and airstrikes they um, can hit. Um, infrastructure and buildings uh, throughout the country. And actually many people uh, had no option uh, to leave and they had to uh, stay hiding in their basements in, uh, or just in their apartments or in uh, the metro, in the underground um, 
and uh, uh, actually uh, people in Kyiv, Kharkiv, in uh, Chernihiv and other cities and towns uh, um, have been constantly shelled um, by, by the Russian artillery and airstrikes. And uh, uh, actually this uh, um, recklessness of the invaders, it has uh, invoked some of the worst pages, the darkest hours of our history like the Nazi invasion against the Soviet Union. And many have already compared uh, the siege of uh, uh, Mariupol to um, the Nazi siege of uh, blockade of Leningrad. And uh, probably the, um, uh, the death toll there will be uh, huge. And uh, uh, many people are dying uh, of starvation and of direct uh, Russian uh, bombs. Uh, some uh, towns and cities uh, have been almost completely destroyed in the hostilities like Volnavaha or Izum. And, uh, uh, well, it's, uh, it's like living in a constant existential horror when you are checking updates from your friends and uh, you have people who, who stay there and you have no no connection with them. And I had, uh, I have uh, friends who have been for two weeks in uh, the Kiev suburbs of uh, Warzel and um, um, Irpin uh, that were without uh, any electricity, fresh water, heating, and no, no connection with them. Uh, they were fortunate enough to um, evacuate ultimately. Uh, but the fate of uh, another, uh, this uh, residential town um, in the Kiev suburbs, uh, Bucha, is now well known to, to, to the entire world. And actually, uh, this evidence of uh, mass atrocities conducted by the Russian military with uh, um, dozens of uh, executed people with uh, numerous reports of uh, rape and other violence against the civilians, with mass graves. So uh, it's, uh, it's, I, I've been uh, very cautious to um, use the term genocide in, in many cases, but this seems as a clear uh, war crime and uh, something like uh, an act of genocide, like it was, for instance, the Pakistani army against uh, uh, the people of Bangladesh in the 70s, or uh, the Indonesian army against the, the people of uh, East Timor at the same time. So it's a direct continuation that brings us uh, further than even uh, the most invoked case of Srebrenica and um, this wars of uh, collapse of Yugoslavia. And uh, well, in general, um, we, we uh, also can have this parallel with the Second World War, um, not just in, in, in this dimension of uh, war crimes, but also in, in uh, that notion that a um, dictator in his bunker has met uh, uh, enormous resistance from the population, both military and civilian resistance. And actually, uh, the citizen towns that have been occupied, like Kherson, like uh, Berdyansk, like Melitopol, um, like um, these um, cities that are uh, near the nuclear uh, plants in Chernobyl and the Parisian nuclear plant, that is Slavutich and uh, Nerhodar, you could see the, the videos of. Uh, probably thousands of people who were protesting the, the invaders who were uh, standing up against the armed um, soldiers uh, who were trying with their bare arms to bare hands to stop the, the armed vehicles. And these are uh, local common people, mostly working class people, both Russian and Ukrainian speaking, I, I think the majority of them are actually Russian speaking. These are uh, mostly um, like Eastern, Southern and Northern parts of, of country with uh, uh, a big amount of uh, Russian speaking population. 
uh, men and women who are, and also people from other uh, ethnic uh, communities as well, like Greeks and Jews and so on, um, people who are joined in their uh, rejection of the um, Russian occupation, and actually it took the invaders uh, several weeks to, to find even some quislings to cooperate with them, because uh, it, it, it seems like uh, the, this uh, resistance is uh, a full, full, full scale and full blowing. And actually, um, what's important besides uh, the armed forces of Ukraine, besides the territorial defense units that were also joined by many volunteers, that uh, the plight of the millions of essential workers and uh, um, volunteers in humanitarian aid networks who actually keep the things going, who um, help the refugees, who help the uh, transportation of the necessary uh, goods and uh, provision. And actually, uh, you could um, see uh, the, the heroic stance of uh, transportation workers, uh, employees of the state railroad company who have uh, evacuated millions of people to safer places, risking their lives. Dozens of them have been killed. Um, then what is done by, uh, by other essential workers, obviously the healthcare workers, uh, nurses and doctors, uh, the firefighters, and, uh, and so on and so on. So actually it's uh, not just about this um, direct resistance on the front line, but also by the tireless work of people uh, who uh, try to help uh, others and who try to uh, keep, um, keep the, the people of Ukraine standing. Um, and that's why, um, you need to have a nuanced uh, vision of what's happening here and to see um, that this is a, an aggression against a, a smaller country and its people. And it's not some kind of dialectical negation of, of uh, the crimes of American imperialism, for instance, but it's direct continuation. It's a direct continuation of the Iraq invasion and uh, the direct con continuation, obviously, of, the, of Russia's its own imperialist uh, wars, starting from the war in Chechnya and uh, um, its uh, uh, interventions to suppress uh, protests in Kazakhstan, in Belarus, and so on. Um, and this, this is why we need um, an international solidarity, uh, a world scale anti war movement. Um, comparable with something that uh, was uh, against the, the aggressions in Vietnam and Iraq. And we need uh, to both um, uh, raise these demands of uh, immediate support for uh, the people in Ukraine. That means uh, um, all kind of support you deem possible for you, uh, but actually we need both humanitarian and military aid and we need the help for the refugees from Ukraine, notwithstanding with their origin and citizenship. Uh, but we need also a more prolonged, uh, more far-fledged uh, demands uh, in order to um, keep uh, Ukrainian infrastructure uh, and to recover it after the war. Uh, so uh, it includes the cancellation of um, the external debt of Ukraine and getting out of this vicious circle of debt and IMF uh, imposed austerity. That means also um, massive investments to rebuild the country. And um, it's usually used this notion of a new Marshall Plan, but whatever. Uh, uh, anyway, it, it, it means some uh, completely other uh, approach to uh, managing the social and economic um, affairs here. Uh, contrary to the previous oligarchic capitalism and something that will be more socially just and um, socially oriented. And it also means uh, putting maximum pressure on the uh, Russian regime. Um, and we know that there are uh, all these uh, personalized sanctions uh, against the Russian oligarchs and the members of the Russian ruling class, but they still can use lots of exemptions to continue uh, to store their wealth abroad uh, um, in, in this context of the uh, existence of tax havens and the offshore capitalism. And this is again a, a question, a demand that transcends just the Ukrainian conflict and, uh, and that uh, brings us to the issue that uh, 
throughout the world, uh, this system has to be uh, challenged and combated and not just the Russian and Ukrainian oligarchs, but um, the, the capitalist class throughout the world should be stripped of these opportunities. And also, uh, given this, the uh, economic base for um, the Russian aggression and for um, another um, petro empires like Saudi Arabia with their um, criminal war in Yemen, uh, again, it's raising the issues of fossil fuels and uh, um, this modern day fossil fuel capitalism and what's the alternative to it. Um, so uh, we need to not just to stop purchasing these fossils from Russia, but also not to do what, what is done by the likes of Boris Johnson, who then come to, to Saudi Arabia that has just executed uh, another dozens of uh, people. Um, and trying to pump up more uh, oil from there, but to think about a, um, a global scale uh, green transition and probably an eco-socialist alternative to the existing neoliberal capitalism. So this all uh, we, we can see as concrete demands in uh, regarding to stop the war, uh, Putin's war on Ukraine, uh, how they uh, go further beyond uh, to uh, the vision of how the, the entire world has to be changed. And obviously the security uh, architecture in the world has also to be transformed completely because uh, um, this dominance of imperialist powers, great powers with their um, veto, uh, veto right in, in the Security Council, uh, um, again, it has to be uh, challenged and we need to uh, get this vision from, from below, the vision that uh, prioritize not uh, these big imperialist players and their security concerns, but actually the, the rights of the peoples and the, the countries uh, that are smaller and they are historically oppressed. Thank you for this invitation and I hope to uh, participate in the exchange. Yeah, uh, thank you, Denis, for this uh, first overview of the current situation in, in the Ukraine and also for your political suggestions, uh, the demands uh, we should put forward. So just uh, in my introduction, I forgot something to tell you. I have, I must excuse two participants. Um, uh, first, Oksana Duczak also from Ukraine. She is also a member of uh, Sozialny Ruch, and she is also uh, one of the editors of the journal Commons, so, uh, Journal for Social Criticism. She had to leave the country. Uh, she is now uh, in Germany, but she has, uh, she, she is right now in a, in a situation that she could not uh, participate. And the second I have to ex uh, excuse is uh, Ilya Budraitskis uh, from Moscow. He also had to leave the country. And probably you can imagine if you have advanced to leave the country, you have to organize a lot of personal stuff, uh, legal stuff, uh, and so on. And uh, we hope that both of them can join us in a further a discussion. At the end of the meeting, I will uh, uh, inform you about uh, a second conference we will organize in two weeks, and probably they can participate uh, in two weeks. So, our second speaker is Maxim Shumakov, also from the, the Ukraine, and you are also a member of uh, Socialny Ruk. And you can add uh, some further elements and further impressions and your point of view of the current situation in Ukraine. Thank you very much for joining us, also uh, very uh, spontaneously. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm very glad to be here today on the discussion. And uh, from my side, I want to bring out some cases, some points uh, on the situations that are here mainly from the western part of Ukraine. I live in and act, uh, and my activism is here in Lviv, is the western part of Ukraine. And uh, uh, 
I will talk from my personal experience as an activist of the social movement and as a person who has been volunteering uh, from the beginning of the Russian invasion. Um, therefore, first of all, uh, I think uh, all we here in Ukraine witnessed uh, since the beginning of the Russian invasions uh, that the uh, weakness of the state institutions caused the lack of the governmental support to the humanitarian causes and problems. And one of the most uh, visible and uh, serious here in the Western part was the uh, flow, this uh, large flow of refugees that uh, part of them stayed uh, in, in the West of Ukraine and part of them lived uh, to the European Union and other countries, uh, mainly to Poland. And as you know, uh, it's more than a million of Ukrainians are now trying to lodge to accommodate in Poland. Uh, therefore, uh, at the beginning of the invasion, most uh, of the works basically was taken up by uh, grassroots activists, by different volunteering and uh, social organizations. Um, so um, there are different groups. Uh, there are different groups here in Ukraine and they have partitioned different activities they, that they are doing. As some universities uh, choose not to stop the, the work they're studying, but to uh, transform the studying process into some kind of volunteering. There are different uh, studying programs like uh, computer science, uh, psychology, and the, the, the uh, mm, uh, and the university principals and administrations encourages students to participate in different activities that are connected to volunteering and to their specializations. For example, uh, the psychologist on the psychologist part uh, to the refugee children, kids, and as a part of the uh, Ukrainian population. Also, uh, as the government couldn't support uh, rail system uh, workers, uh, the, the most of the workers uh, organized the system to uh, help for refugees to get to the Poland and European countries, uh, not getting enough of their wages and working, for example, for two or three days fu fully without any um, vacation or the weekend. Uh, so that also was a kind of volunteering from the labor part of Ukraine. Uh, another side of the humanitarian problems uh, was that the uh, trade unions found that they have no uh, way to uh, mm, have a limited to, uh, uh, support the trade union. The trade unionists uh, are taking part in the defense units, for example, in territorial defense. Uh, so, not of the not all of the equipment can be provided for them from this part. Uh, another major humanitarian problem here in Ukraine is the problem of accommodation and lodging uh, in Lviv. For example, uh, in my apartment, there was a different, some people from Kharkiv, from Sumy, uh, Dnipro is a city that on the Eastern part, part of Ukraine. And when they tried to later on to rent some accommodation in the city, they've discovered that the prices that was average before the war are now really higher. And it's uh, very hard to find a good accommodation with good uh, and, uh, Mm. Uh, with the good uh, renters and so on. And uh, there is this contradiction like that uh, uh, even a lot of people cannot afford or cannot find a free apartment, but in Lviv there are a lot of uh, apartments that are just uh, not, that, that, do, that their people do not live because a lot of Lviv residents lived the city. Uh, to stay in the villages where it is safer to be. And a lot of these apartments are just staying without the people to be lodged there. 
Uh, and uh, as organization, social movement, we've tried to get uh, some kind of building to make uh, um, to fix it to fix it uh, buy enough uh, beds and uh, lodging uh, places to get the refugees. But uh, it's been already uh, three weeks, as I remember, and we have no uh, response response from the, our local government here in Lviv. So we try to connect, to communicate with the local deputies, but it's really hard to uh, set up the enough uh, um, enough uh, good connection with them. I mean, and uh, another part is the refugees who are now staying in Poland. Uh, we have a lot of discussions with uh, Polish. Uh, trade unions, uh, for example, one of them is Inicjatywa Pracownicza, and they have, uh, um, and they want to support Ukrainian uh, refugees, as there are, appeared a lot of cases when the people were uh, hired for the job with a very low wage, or even there are cases when people are not getting at all wage, but work just to, for them to be accommodated in the Poland. So this trade union initiative of Pratsvinicia with uh, connection with uh, support of our organization, social movement, is trying to make some instructions, some uh, information leaflets uh, for the people, for the refugees of Ukraine to join the trade union for their rights to not to be violated, to be uh, supported by the Polish government and try to some kind uh, fix all these humanitarian problems that appeared since the invasion. Thank you. Christian Thun. <laughs> Thank you very much, Maxi, for giving us this very uh, concrete picture and for giving us also some thoughts of uh, how we can develop uh, solidarity activities. Uh, so now I welcome Hanna. She will give us some more historical uh, views on the emergence of the Ukraine, of the Ukraine, Ukrainian nation. And uh, Hanna had worked at the university very intensively on the uh, concept of nationalities of the Bolsheviks. And based on this uh, work, she can give us some insights how to deal currently right now with the question, with the national question. So Hanna, it's you, up to you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, Ukraine is the second largest country in Europe after Russia, but uh, its history is very little known here uh, in the West. Uh, it remained uh, for a long time in the shadow of the Russian historical narrative. And uh, let me say it uh, <laughs> clearly from the beginning, I think it's partly uh, because of the ignorance of, uh, of this historical dimension of Russian-Ukrainian relations that we are now uh, powerless witnesses of this uh, barbaric war that Putin's army wages against the Ukrainian population. Uh, until 1991, uh, Ukrainians didn't actually have their own state. They were incorporated into empires uh, and they were ruled by those who didn't recognize them as a separate political and cultural community, considering them instead as a part of their, their own nations. Uh, this was particularly the case for Ukrainians in the, in the Russian Empire. Uh, Ukrainian society was uh, influenced by this long history of imperial domination and by uh, an opposition between the countryside and the cities. Uh, the cities that were centers of uh, colonial domination uh, in Ukraine. And I will just give you a quote um, by a certain uh, Leon Trotsky, 
who described the Russian presence in Ukraine in the beginning of the 20th century. So he wrote the following. Uh, separated from the essential mass of the population, not only but by their level of life and their uh, mores, but also by their language, just like the British uh, in, Ingi in India. Uh, landowners, indu industrialists and merchants grouped around them a narrow cycle of civil servants, employees, schoolmasters, doctors, lawyers, journalists, and even workers, all of them Russian, Russians. Uh, they, therefore, uh, they were transforming the cities into the centers of Russification and colonization. End of the quote. So in the beginning of the 20th century, being uh, Ukrainian actually uh, meant and was a synonym uh, uh, of being a peasant. So there was a strong correlation between ethnicity and social position in Ukraine, uh, which uh, led to the inevitable politicization of both national and class identities. Um, in uh, 1917, when the Russian Empire started to disintegrate uh, after the revolution, uh, Ukrainians uh, took the initiative to form their own state. However, uh, the projects uh, of society uh, were uh, very uh, numerous and the interests of different social and political forces uh, too. Uh, the civil war broke out and Ukraine became a war zone uh, where many governments uh, succeeded. Uh, uh, changed uh, until the Bolsheviks uh, took power in the 1920s, the 20. Uh, and the Bolshevik leaders uh, began uh, to realize that the formally separate uh, Soviet Ukraine was not only a good um, tactical response to, to neutralize the Ukrainian nationalists, but it also had some long-term advantages. Uh, because um, in this conception, Leninist conception, uh, each Soviet nation was um, was to have its own uh, delimited uh, uh, territory, its own uh, national state. So, uh, by making such a concession to to nationalities, uh, the Bolsheviks hoped to preserve the territorial integrity of the former Russian empire uh, and uh, to transform it into a socialist state where in the future, all the nation would merge and would disappear first in the Soviet Union and then in the worldwide scale. And uh, this policy of um, promoting uh, a formal uh, national independence was uh, pursued within the framework of a, a very centralized state, especially from the economic and political point of view. Um, and this, this is what gave the Soviet Union its uh, distinctive form and created this, this knot of contradictions uh, we deal with uh, today. Um, in the 1920s, uh, in Ukraine, uh, there were certain concessions uh, made to Ukrainians in the cultural, economic, and political spheres. Uh, but with uh, the rise of uh, Stalin to power in the late uh, 20s, these concessions were replaced by, by repressions. Uh, in order to be able to finance uh, the industrialization to feed the growing uh, urban centers, uh, it was necessary actually to break uh, the resistance of, of, of peasants, of peasants that were opposed to the forced uh, collect collectivization. And some extremely uh, violent uh, measures were put in place in just one, one year between 
four in, or six uh, million uh, Ukrainian peasants died from this artificial, uh, artificial uh, hunger. Uh, and at the same time, the Ukrainian political and cultural um, elites uh, were uh, wiped out by, by repressions. Several thousands of communist uh, Ukrainian intellectuals have been murdered. But even uh, after this, uh, the Stalinist uh, repression, the Stalin, the Stalin era, uh, during the second part of the century, 20th century, uh, a large part of the Ukrainian population was still uh, subject to a kind of assimilation policy, because despite uh, the slogans of, uh, about the friendship of, of Soviet nations, uh, the Russian language and culture were the only ones to be uh, really promoted. And yeah, more and more Ukrainians were changing their language, their identity. It was uh, also the case in my family. So ethnically, we are 100% Ukrainian, but uh, the generation of my grandparents started to speak uh, Russian in order to integrate themselves into the urban uh, Soviet uh, society in order to stop being despised because of their peasant uh, language. So therefore, uh, my mother tongue is, is Russian, like the most of, of uh, Ukrainian, it is the case for the most of Ukrainian urban uh, population. So yeah, that was my uh, <laughs> short uh, historical excurs to <laughs> Ukrainian history. Um, yeah, so as you know, Ukraine became independent in 1991, but uh, Russian uh, domination and its different forms uh, persisted because the balance of power uh, between the former colonial co core uh, Russia and its former colonial periphery uh, Ukraine was never really, really questioned. And uh, now, Russian imperial ambitions are killing Ukrainians, killing Ukrainian civilians. Uh, they are threatening the, the world, the world peace. And it's reality we need and, and we need to face it. And uh, it's, it is an um, imperialism driven by the, by the resentment of a, of a fallen empire. And is, this is also an imperialism um, of states that do not have any uh, alternative political or economic project to propose <laughs> to the world. Uh, and it, it, it can only rely on its military force. And uh, yeah, and this is also the imperialist project uh, of, of, uh, of a special uh, mission uh, because it, is convinced of defending a conservative vision of the world, uh, refuting any democratic uh, ideas, and any attempt for a democratic change is something Putin destroys, not only in Ukraine, but he, dis he tried to destroy it also in Georgia, in Belarus, in Kazakhstan, in, in Syria, etc., in many other countries. But above about all he's trying to destroy this uh, democratic alternative in his own country. Um, so it's in, for me, it's far, 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 far from these claims about the threat of, of NATO and, and all other um, arguments. For me, it's uh, indeed, uh, against these uh, democratic aspirations of people that Putin wage his war and he wages this war for four years already. Uh, and the invasion of Ukraine is uh, kind of a culmination point of this long process that um, some of us didn't want to, to face up. Uh, and uh, from my point of view, some of us were also locked in a, in, in a kind of a Western-centered uh, vision of, of imperialism, 
So, but now the people of Russia in, and the people of Ukraine and those of the, of the whole region are kind of taken hostage um, by Putin and by his uh, clan and, and they are ready as we saw it. Uh, they are ready for any barbarity. But uh, yeah, I think it shouldn't paralyze us. On the contrary, it's, it's time to act. And, uh, and um, I agree with all the revendication and demands that uh, Denise uh, explained to us. And yeah, many of us want to live in a, in, a, in a peaceful and more peaceful and more egalitarian world. And I think we can do more uh, to go in, in this direction. So I will stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Hannah, for giving us these insights in important parts of, in the, of the history of the Ukraine and, and the, the, the emergence of the Ukrainian, Ukrainian state and the old debates, which are, of course, still very important. And it's important to know these elements. So I'm happy uh, to welcome Ilya Putraitskis. He was able uh, to change schedule and to, 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 to join us. So I'm very happy to give him the opportunity to present his uh, perspective. As I told you in, at the beginning, he comes from Russia. He uh, has uh, uh, teached at, at the university at the School of Social and Economic Science in Moscow, and he uh, regularly publish articles in Left East and Open Left and other publications. And it's very important for us to really bring together uh, Left people, socialists from Russia and Ukraine, and of course, from Western Europe. So it's up to you. Uh, welcome, Ilya. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having me here. Uh, unfortunately, for the last uh, months, uh, I'm uh, not uh, living in uh, Russia anymore uh, because uh, the situation became uh, quite uh, uh, quite dangerous for any people who openly declare its anti-war position. Uh, but anyway, I am I am still in contact with uh, with uh, my comrades, with the people who are still in uh... Ilya, do you hear us? Uh, the connection seems to be interrupted. Uh, probably you have to leave and to, to reconnect if you hear us. Maybe we can start with uh, Gilbert and then yeah, yes. see if I just, yeah. I just sent him an, an email. We changed the schedule. I, I, I hope he can reconnect, uh, be reconnected. Uh, Gilbert, so um, yeah. <clears throat> as I okay. presented you, you wrote different very controversial articles in the recent weeks, highly controversial. There is a, a huge debate going on in the left in Europe. And uh, please explain us your position. <laughs> yeah, th thank you, uh, Christian. Um, <clears throat> and uh, thank you for organizing this. Thank you for uh, 
this opportunity to to meet comrades is a fantastic opportunity to meet comrades from uh, from Ukraine and of and my old friend Ilya um, and and the, 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 the whole the whole audience so that's uh, that's great um, second point you keep saying that I wrote controversial articles I didn't write controversial articles I wrote uh, uh, a position a point of view all positions are controversial Mine is not more controversial than anyone else, you know. Uh, uh, so uh, I don't think this is a, the, 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 the appropriate way to, to, to present it. Thank you. Um, uh, so the first thing I, I want to say is that um, I believe that uh, the, oh, Elia is back actually. Would, uh, would we let uh, Elia uh, carry on because so, I haven't so, started uh, really. Uh... Okay, so maybe I will finish yeah. because I. I, I <laughs> okay, just problems. Ilya, just go on and then we. we uh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I have a problem with the internet in this uh, place. Uh, so the uh, first point is uh, that we are uh, entering the fascization of the uh, political uh, regime uh, in uh, Russia. And for example, if you go into all this uh, terrible situation with the mass uh, massacre in in Bucha in in the um, uh, nearby Kiev uh, after this uh, uh, shocking um, facts, uh, Russia not just uh, start to deny. Uh, or put some kind of alternative facts uh, agenda, but in fact, it start to justify the the massacre, which is uh, which is uh, kind of new for uh, for the Russian uh, propaganda style. Uh, so, for example, uh, yesterday uh, there was appearance of a number of articles. Uh, one of them was uh, published on uh, RIA Novosti, which is the uh, mainstream uh, official um, news. Uh, agency uh, and the article there explained uh, that uh, basically we had uh, as Russia a mistake in this uh, military operation because we believed that it's operation uh, to liberate uh, the Ukrainian people from the group of Nazis. But now it became clear that most of Ukrainians are, uh, are Nazified. Most of Ukrainians, they are uh, Nazis. Uh, and uh, the denazification de means uh, de-Ukrainization. That was the, one of the main points of this uh, article. So most of Ukrainians uh, should be violently uh, punished um, uh, because they are Nazis. Uh, the Ukrainian Nazism uh, is uh, much more dangerous uh, than the Hitler's Nazism uh, um, uh, in the in the Second World War, and the struggle against this Nazism is the last uh, like thesis of this article uh, is the only Russian thing because all the other countries uh, they are in some way collaborate with Nazis, so uh, it's the only position of the Russian state to define the Nazis from the non-Nazis. So uh, here the very term Nazis use as the uh, very concrete, uh, like a tool of dehumanization of uh, Ukrainians. The idea that uh, Ukraine uh, should be uh, destroyed as the country and uh, its population should be punished uh, with uh, some kind of ethnical cleanings, uh, that, that, uh, that, that was very clear uh, from this material. Uh, you had also uh, some of uh, these uh, explanations uh, in, uh, which use the same language in the, uh, the same uh, line of uh, arguments. And uh, for uh, the moment, uh, you see that uh, in, the, um, uh, in the case of Russia, you see the uh, clear uh, use of the very uh, fascistic arguments of the very fascistic uh, ways how this political regime operate uh, inside the country. Uh, this uh, new form of fascism uh, 
instead of the historical fascism, not based on any, uh, let's say, uh, mass movement. So it's not about the movement. So it's like fascization coming from the, uh, from the top and the situation of the very deep uh, social atomization and uh, lack of uh, any, uh, let's say, self-organization uh, in the society. And the main uh, aim of this, uh, of this regime to destroy any forms of, uh, of solidarity, any forms of uh, self-organization, any forms of the resistance uh, in the society. However, you can say that um, uh, the Russian society is very much united. So, uh, of course, you have all these uh, opinion polls. Uh, for example, it was the recent opinion poll, uh, poll uh, made by Levada Center that um, around um, uh, Fifty uh, percent of uh, Russians they supported this uh, so-called military operation in Ukraine, and some um, some thirty percent they likely supported this operation, and only around uh, twenty who are likely not supported or strongly opposed the operation. But uh, as some uh, pollsters. Uh, 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 explained uh, the main problem with all the polls in Russia that 90% of people, they simply refuse to answer these questions. So that means all this kind of uh, opinion polls is uh, uh, me, me, quite uh, uh, meaningless uh, because this atmosphere of uh, fear, uh, the uh, kind of uh, totalitarian, uh, totalitarian um, uh, uh, forced agreement, public agreement uh, in the society uh, block any, uh, you know, true uh, expression of uh, the real uh, thoughts of Russians about the war. Um, every day you have uh, the you know hundreds of evidences uh, from different cities of Russia from uh, with some individual uh, acts of resistance uh, like some uh, some uh, uh, people uh, destroy the this uh, Z uh, uh, symbols the symbols of um, of this uh, war in Ukraine uh, from the uh, Russian side. Uh, there were uh, some collective uh, letters uh, from uh, professors, from scientists, uh, from uh, different uh, like layers of uh, society against the, uh, against the war. Uh, there are many uh, individual acts uh, like uh, posters, like graffitis in the cities uh, and so on. So you can't say that there is no, uh, that there is no resistance. But uh, this uh, resistance uh, uh, for the moment uh, avoid any public uh, forms, any forms of the clear uh, uh, organization. Uh, and even uh, um, organization on the uh, national uh, on the national scale. Uh, of course, uh, the, uh, this uh, kind of condition where uh, this uh, propaganda uh, from uh, Kremlin uh, creates a totally different uh, picture of what what is going on in Ukraine from reality uh, is um, uh, is something that could work only for the short terms. So it's not possible to cover for a long time the big number of uh, losses uh, in the uh, Russian army. It's hard, it's hard to uh, cover for a long time uh, the real failure of um, uh, of the military plan of the Russian army uh, in uh, Ukraine. Uh, that's why, uh, of course, uh, 
Putin uh, definitely want to finish this uh, war as soon as possible, but with some uh, kind of uh, victory uh, or some image of victory that could be uh, 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 sold from uh, for the uh, for the population by propaganda. Uh, just uh, two days ago, it was very useful comment from one of the Russian. Uh, liberal experts that uh, basically you already have a kind of split inside the Russian elite, but that's not a split in between the those who oppose the war and those who support the war, but that is split uh, between those uh, who are ready to end it and who understand that uh, they should end it as soon as possible. And uh, those uh, who are ready to continue to the final kind of suicide uh, of the uh, Russian army and the uh, Russian state. And this kind of split became more and more visible when you see the difference in positions uh, between, for example, such people as Ramzan Kadyrov, uh, the, the chief of uh, uh, the, the head of che Chechen, um, Chechen Republic and Chechen uh, gangs in the territory of uh, Ukraine, and the people like uh, Dmitry Peskov, uh, who is the official spokesperson for uh, Putin, who uh, used to be a kind of more moderate uh, than Kadyrov in his in his view on the uh, situation. And of course, both of them, they belong to the party of war, but for now their perspectives became, uh, became more and more uh, different. So uh, the last thing uh, is uh, about the um, uh, possible uh, the possible uh, points of uh, instability in uh, Russia. Uh, I think that it's still some possibility of the you know split in the very top of the uh, state because of course all the situation the war that is going to be to be a failure for um, uh, Russia. The impact of uh, economic sanctions uh, became a real. Uh, um, challenge a huge challenge for the very like a uh, uh, model uh, of the uh, putin's uh, state and uh, it's it's hard to imagine that uh, they will survive uh, through this uh, challenge but also uh, i think uh, that it will be definitely uh, some uh, some kind of problems uh, or um, with in, in, in between the Moscow and the regions of Russia, because of course, Russia is a very diverse uh, country with a very multinational uh, population. And the idea of the Russian world uh, should be uh, something uh, not acceptable for the uh, national minorities uh, who are presented uh, quite, uh, quite massively in the uh, Russian army. Uh, and also, of course, uh, all this situation will be a huge challenge for the model of the Putin state, which is uh, far from uh, the principle of federation, but in reality is a very centralized uh, uh, state uh, where the Moscow rule uh, ruled the uh, regions of um, uh, of Russia and also, of course, some social protests there uh, also um, uh, possible uh, as far as the uh, as the economic crisis and the failure of uh, war uh, will become more and more clear. So uh, I probably will uh, end with it. <laughs> so I just uh, try to maybe put uh, some some points, but of course they could be uh, developed and detailed in many ways. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ilya, for giving us uh, these insights on, on Russia and also the transformation and continuation of the Russian regime and its, its radicalization towards uh, a very, very bad uh, development. Uh, so we come again, we come back to Gilbert.
Yeah, thank you, uh, <clears throat> Christian. Uh, so, uh, um, first point I, I wanted to make is that uh, the, uh, the 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 Ukrainians are fighting for all of us today. Of course, they are fighting for their own country. They are fighting for fighting for their own people. These are obvious things, but they are also fighting for the Russian people. Actually, they are also fighting for the Russian opposition, the Russian Democrats, the Russian internationalists, because the more, the, the better they resist, the better the chances will be for those who fight for democracy and uh, against war and imperialism in Russia itself, uh, uh, the better the conditions will be for, for, for them. And the same goes for the rest uh, of, of the world. Uh, uh, this is really today one of those crucial fights against imperialism. There were quite a few of them over, over time. Uh, the resistance of the Vietnamese people against American imperialism was very crucial in determining uh, uh, the, the, the global conditions of the time. The defeat of the United States paralyzed US imperialism for a, a period of 17 years. And that therefore created conditions which were uh, uh, actually conditions that helped some peace processes, including Gorbachev in the United uh, in the Soviet Union and uh, the, uh, major steps uh, towards disarmament. So today, the Ukrainian resistance is really uh, one of those focal points in history. And it is absolutely crucial. And it is a remarkable resistance. It's a real popular war. I mean, of course, the regular army is, is uh, fully involved in that. But it is fully involved with the mor moral of, of an army defending its country. And the difference in morale between the Ukrainian army and the Russian army has been very much clear in this war eh, between soldiers who are really motivated because they are defending their country and their families and soldiers who realize that they are being uh, sent as cannon fodder in, a, in, an, in an invasion war, in a, in a dirty war, absolutely dirty war. So the, the fantastic resistance that the, 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 the Ukrainians, not only their regular army, but the population, this National Guard, the, the, the women and men, uh, every kind of, of contribution from, from, from the, the, you know, the, the, what we heard about the refugees and all that, to, uh, to filling bottles for, for cocktail, Molotov cocktails or, or, or the rest. I mean, this is a real mobilization of an entire population. It is absolutely uh, remarkable. Now, let us imagine just for, for the sake of understanding how important this has been, let us imagine that uh, uh, the Russian army managed to just take control of Ukraine, change government in, in Kyiv, put uh, on in power some, uh, some uh, you know, some uh, 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 agent of Moscow and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and impose its, uh, its, uh, its totalitarian order on, on the country. Well, that would have been, that would have been an absolutely disaster result Again, not only for Ukraine and the Ukrainians, it will have been a hugely disastrous results for the Russians, for the Russian Democrats, for, for the, 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 the Russian opposition and all that, and for the rest of the world, because we would have been in a situation where NATO would have you know, been uh, uh, reinforcing uh, uh, and going ahead in this warmongering that happened already, because already Vladimir Putin has uh, 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 has made a fantastic gift to NATO by with his his war. Uh, this has uh, NATO was already uh, accused of being obsolete before this war, and suddenly you have had this revival of NATO. You have now countries like Finland want to to join NATO after decades of of uh, of neutrality, and and you have a, a country like Germany who is. Uh, uh, increasing massively its, uh, its military expenditure, everything is going on. So had Putin managed to control Ukraine as he wished, this would have carried on in a even much higher, at a much higher level. And our argument as anti-war, 
as anti-imperialist would have been completely muted. Just imagine the situation that would have been there had uh, Russia taken full control of, of Ukraine. Uh, who could have listened to us when we say we are against increase in military expenditure, for instance? So that's the point here. Ukraine has been fighting and is fighting for, for all of us. And add to that, that the success of a regime which is today the most visible far-right regime in the world, which is that of Vladimir Putin. He was matched with uh, Donald Trump, but Donald Trump, because of the peculiarities of the United States, uh, uh, could not completely take over. Just, I mean, had Donald Trump managed to do what he wanted to do, uh, you know, in, in this the attack on the Capitol and 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 uh, and stuck to power, we would have had these two these two guys. But but the fact is that the model, the inspiration of the far right today worldwide is is Vladimir Putin. And had he been successful, this would have reinforced massively this trend. So we have to understand that this is an inspiring resistance. This is a resistance for 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 us all. We are all. Uh, uh, indebted to the Ukrainians who, for their heroic resistance and very uh, inspiring uh, struggle. Now, <clears throat> I'll come here to the what uh, Christian called the controversial, which is the result, I mean, it shouldn't be controversial actually, but it's the result of the fact that for many decades, and especially du during the, the whole time of the Cold War, uh, there was one imperialism that was intervening globally and worldwide in a very uh, intensive matter, and that was U.S. imperialism and its allies. The war in Korea, the war in Vietnam, uh, uh, wars here and there. There were plenty of wars in which uh, the United States, uh, in particular, was leading this uh, this uh, uh, comment. Now, uh, we, I mean. Uh, for part of, of the, the global left, there was also a solidarity with the people of, of, of Russia and Eastern Europe uh, against the Stalinist regime in the Soviet Union. But uh, a big part of the left, and especially all the left that was pro-Soviet Union, pro-Moscow, was what we call campist. That is, they, they, they used to align behind Moscow, whatever Moscow, Moscow did. Now, the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, 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 by the end of 1991. And, and we entered into a period during which, I mean, that period was called the unipolar moment, during which the United States appeared as the only, you know, superpower left. And the United States indeed went into imp very ugly imperialist expeditions. A war on Iraq in 1991, uh, the intervention in Somalia, the, 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 the war, the invasion of Afghanistan, the invasion and occupation of Iraq in 2003. So we have had all that. And so the, this big part of the left remained on the idea and the view that only uh, uh, the United States is the, is the, the enemy, the, the imperialist. And so you have what I call a neocampist, which is not alignment behind someone, but alignment against, if you want. So the logic of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Since my enemy is Washington, any regime that is against Washington is okay. And this is a completely, of course, uh, uh, I mean, it's a logic that has nothing to do with the, with the, with the, with the, with the left and with anti-imperialism, especially when it ends up supporting another imperialism. And in this case, I'm speaking of, of Russia's imperialism because whatever, uh, discussion one could have had about the nature of the Soviet Union uh, with Marxist categories like imperialism and the rest, there is no possible discussion about the nature of Russia. Russia is a fully monopolist capitalist uh, state and actually one of the most reactionary types of capitalism, uh, most socially backward reactionary type of capitalism and an imperialist country uh, with, with two main sectors uh, the, 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 the hydrocarbons and the arms industries, which are the, 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 the two pillars of, uh, of the, Russian, uh, uh, the Russian economy. So, um, so this, is, this is the point here. Now, even among the part of the left 
that understood that Russia is an imperialist country, we, you still have old, uh, I would say, uh, reflexes. And this, uh, this idea that uh, uh, we see today in those, and, and the, po the position which is the most incoherent, because the, those who support Russia are coherent, right? They, are, they, are, they have nothing to do with the left, but they are, they are coherent. But those who say, we support Ukraine, but we are against providing Ukraine with weapons, and we are against any economic pressure on Russia, well, are in a completely incoherent position, completely incoherent. That would, I mean, when, when the, the Germany and Italy were intervening in Spain in the Spanish Civil War, were we against delivery of weapons uh, from French imperialism, French colonialism, uh, where you had the Popular Front or, or the, 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 the US imperialism, the Roosevelt government, or were the left asking and demanding that these countries send weapons, which they didn't. They didn't, but that was a, a, a demand. So uh, th this is an, an understanding here that when you have a people <clears throat> fighting against an imperialist invasion, you have to support this people to support their struggle. Their struggle is important for you as much as it is for them. And to support their struggle, you need to support their right to get weapons, the, we the, the weapons they need for their defense from whichever source has this weapon and is willing, uh, uh, is, is willing uh, to, uh, to, 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 uh, to, 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 to give them that. So this is the point here, which, which you call controversial. It shouldn't be actually, but there are taboos. I mean, uh, uh, Hannah mentioned uh, Leon Trotsky. Uh, uh, well, he, he has a, a famous text of 1938, where he says, if, the, if, the, if he, fascist Italia wanted to send weapons to the Algerian fighters against French colonialism, just because of opportunistic reasons, because Italy is uh, 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 a rival of, of uh, French colonialism, Italian colonialism, then we should support this. And he even says, if, 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 the, if the port workers in Italy are on strike, they should stop the strike for the, the weapons. They, they should do an exception to let the weapons be sent to the Algerian fighters against uh, French colonialism. So, I mean, this is a famous article. It's not a problem here. The, the issue is you don't need the Trotsky or whatever reference. Uh, the, the issue is clear. It's not a matter of religion or the Pope said that or, or, or it's in the gospel. The issue is that you can't support a people and the right to fight if you consider that they are fighting a just war and say at the same time you are against support, uh, giving them the means to fight. This is a hypocritical position, which ends up actually in, uh, in calling them to capitulate. Because I hear some people, parts of the left say, oh, we are against sending them weapons because that prolongs the war. And we are for negotiations and peace. What does it mean? It means they have to accept the conditions imposed on them by Russia and stop fighting. That's what it, that means. So that's not a support. That is actually the, the, the very contrary of a support. It, it claims to support the Ukrainian struggle, but actually, where if, I, if, if people who say that were, uh, I mean, go in the street and demonstrate against their countries in London, in Madrid, in, in, in Paris, in Berlin, against sending weapons to the Ukrainians, they would actually be helping the Russian. Uh, occupation. They would not be helping the Ukrainian people. So we have to understand this and not deal with taboos or with Pavlovian uh, 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 reactions to to the to the uh, uh, to everything that Washington does. Now, all this being said, and I will end with with that point, we shouldn't also fall in the in the reverse kind of position, which I can find sometimes among some Eastern European comrades, uh, which is to belittle. The, 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 the responsibility and the role of NATO in, in all that and the United States. Actually, Vladimir Putin is the result, a product 
of Washington's uh, uh, behavior uh, toward, toward Russia. The conditions that were created by, by Washington and the in, in International Monetary Fund and the rest in Russia created social economic disaster and catastrophe that led to that. Plus the humiliation that was imposed on Russia is another factor that, that intervened. That is the comparison that has been made a lot, which is correct between Weimar Germany and, and uh, the, uh, Russia in the 90s. And you know what, what resulted from Weimar Germany, and we know what, what, what is resulting today uh, in, in, in Russia. Uh, and the, the United States uh, uh, proclaimed a new world order when the, when the Soviet Union uh, collapsed. And yet what you had, uh, you had exactly the contrary. Washington went into illegal, illegitimate wars in Kosovo against no mandate from the United uh, uh, Nations Security Council. It was uh, from the point of view of international war law, that was an illegal war. Kosovo, uh, uh, the invasion of Iraq, of course, the, 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 the big one. And, and that has created the ground, you know, and also the, the, the kind of conditions that enable someone like Putin. And actually when they blame Putin, he tells them you are hypocrites because you did the same. And on this, he is right, I'm sorry to say, but he is right on this. So we have to say all that. And, and comrades in Eastern Europe should understand us. We are fighting against uh, imperialism. Uh, I mean, I belong to an area who, are fight, who is suffering from both imperialism. I'm an Arab, I'm from the Middle East, and we had them both. We had American imperialism, disastrous in Iraq. We have Israel, the ally of US imperialism, and we have Russia. We have Russian imperialism in Syria and all that. So we have them all. And we have, and that's why I think we are in a privileged position, if I with a lot of quote marks on privilege, to understand that the fight against imperialism is against all imperialist countries and should be as radical against and every one of them as it is against the other. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shilber, for these very clear arguments and very consistent, very coherent arguments. And I, uh, I completely agree that uh, uh, your line of argument is important to put forward in the entire left, in Europe and in the US. So we have the possibility that each speaker of you can make some additional remarks to other contributors, but I suggest that we quickly go to already to the questions of the public. But if there is a, a remark someone wants to make of you to, an, uh, to another panelist, uh, just go on. Otherwise, I would just take uh, some questions from the public. Okay. Um, there are two questions or two uh, uh, remarks on solidarity. One is uh, on trade unions. Uh, Lars Hendriksson from Sweden he informed us about a very interesting uh, activity of solidarity when he or colleagues or workers from Sweden became aware that the, the factory uh, receives intermediate products from a factory in the Ukraine. And so they, they, uh, they, they produced uh, a solidarity uh, message and this, of course, was very friendly welcomed by the Ukrainian workers. It's just a very concrete, small example, but this is a very sympathetic activity, of course. Uh, then I would ask probably to Dennis or Maxim uh, if there are activities going on, on on labor solidarity or if there are more some kinds of yeah projects uh, going on i've i've read that uh, from uk there is 
some kind of convoy being organized. That could be uh, a point of discussion that you, Maxim or, or Dennis, could inform us. And the second question also to Maxim and Dennis is uh, someone asked, what's, what's about Sozialin uh, Ruch social movement? What kind of organization it is? It's just a small uh, group of young radical leftists without any social influence or what are you doing in your, what kind of activities you are doing? So probably you, one of Dennis or Maxim can take one of each question. I suppose they are interconnected, so yes, of course, can, we can react on, on both. So actually, yes, it's um, what uh, Lars sent this uh, example of um, worker to worker solidarity. Yes, it's quite inspiring. It actually it's one of the the things we try in in social movement and social network to do. Uh, to connect um, uh, working class people and their organizations uh, from abroad with um, pretty uh, concrete uh, uh, working collectives here and their organizations. So we have uh, lists of uh, needed stuff that is required by a number of local branches of uh, our comrades at trade unions. And uh, I think that we, we should do more uh, these connections on the level, on this grassroots level, um, not via all this, uh, you know, bureaucracy and so on, but uh, with um, directly labor unions speaking to labor unions and workers speaking to workers. And also, uh, yes, you mentioned the convoys, um, uh, the comrades from uh, the labor movement in um, the UK, they are uh, have long been organized in this Ukraine solidarity campaign that has been raising the issues of uh, Ukrainian workers for uh, I think the more than eight years. And um, every time we had a major strike, uh, for instance, miners in Kraviri or uh, transportation workers in Kyiv, um, they could even raise these issues in the uh, the parliament. Uh, the UK Parliament, and actually, uh, it's uh, now uh, still very relevant because obviously, any time, any crisis, um, just in 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 this framework of shock doctrine, uh, the neoliberal uh, sections of ruling class they try to seize the opportunity and to cut uh, uh, labor rights and to somehow. Um, worsen the situation of the same essential workers that are crucial for uh, the resistance in Ukraine. And uh, that's another uh, example why, why we need this international solidarity, international pressure, including on our oligarchs and our MPs and our uh, ministries. Um, but obviously, there are also these convoys that are in um, I think Hannah can also uh, add because uh, her comrades in Switzerland and her comrades in uh, France uh, from uh, the New Anti Capitalist Party, from uh, Ensemble, from uh, CGT, from Sud uh, on the side of unions, they are uh, thinking and collecting uh, things to um, have convoys. We already had the first convoy from Bosnia that had also this um, important history in the 90s when uh, there was a, a um, leftist uh, uh, trade union convoy to support the, the people in besieged uh, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina's uh, uh, cities. And uh, yes, that's why it's important. And a couple of words about the social movement. Uh, I, I hope Maxi will add uh, also. Yes, it's, you could say it's tiny, it's small. Uh, as uh, almost all left, uh, progressive democratic left in, in Eastern Europe, uh, I think besides Razum in Poland, uh, Levica in uh, Slovenia and uh, left Greens in uh, Croatia, uh, we have no other examples of uh, new left parties that uh, got into parliaments in this uh, Central European states. And uh, uh, we are working in a very harsh condition, combining um, both worst sides of oligarchic wild capitalism and uh, the legacy of Stalinism with uh, all these uh, atrocities and uh, crimes that were committed in 
in the name of so-called socialism. And this obviously contributed to the discreditation of the leftist ideas here. Uh, but actually, at the moment, I would say that we are the most, uh, the, the largest and the most visible activist organization on the left in Ukraine. And we are uh, working with uh, uh, the trade unions in both the Confederation of Free Trade Unions and Federation of Trade Unions with uh, the miners, uh, railroad workers, uh, construction workers, crane workers, and so on. We are working with uh, different social movements, uh, with uh, feminist and environmentalist movements. So I would say that. Uh, um, at the moment, given the harsh conditions, uh, we, are, we are trying to do the best at, as uh, the voice for the uh, democratic socialist option in, in Ukraine, contrary to the oligarchy capitalist uh, um, mainstream. And actually, um, like without, uh, without this, uh, um, these efforts and without also international solidarity, um, it will be even harsher for us because uh, uh, if um, the international left is pointed at here and said that, okay, these people are against uh, supporting Ukraine and these people are um, somehow sabotaging uh, Ukrainian defense and uh, they are anti-Ukrainian and so on, it obviously again contributes to the um, discreditation of the left in Ukraine. So maybe Maxim and Hanna can also tell something about this solidarity and about social movement. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to add about solidarity and that uh, since the beginning of the war, it didn't to, it took long for our parliament uh, to uh, adopt behind the scenes of this all political issues and the international political support to Ukrainian government to adopt the bill that really violates the workers' rights. It, it it lets for the employers to uh, expand the working time uh, for 20 more uh, hours a week to expand it also to six days instead of five days and uh, being uh, the um, uh, NGO uh, social movement we cannot uh, make gather demonstration make protest due to the martial law being now in Ukraine Therefore, the international support for the working class, for our comrades from, from abroad to support the labor movements, trade units, it, it's really significant for the to some kind, uh, somehow uh, influence the Ukrainian government to support the workers and uh, different workers, workers, labor organizations. Yeah, I will just add uh, uh, some 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 thoughts about the actions of solidarity. Uh, here in Switzerland, we have our committee, and we're engaged in some uh, practical uh, issues and questions of humanitarian aid, and uh, uh, we are helping refugees. But we are also um, using our platform actually to relay uh, the demands and the reivindication and positions of our Ukrainian comrades, trend unionists and uh, left left wing uh, activists. So we are trying to give them voice here. Uh, and also it helps us, uh, yeah, it helps to oppose this hypocritical uh, position of, of supporting Ukraine without really, uh, without the real support. Because what is really frustrating that most of the uh, left-wing organizations here uh, in Europe and Switzerland, uh, they, uh, they are engaged in uh, never-ending debates, but they are doing, uh, most of them are doing uh, practically nothing to, to help Ukrainians, uh, even, I'm not talking about the military help, but even civilians. So we're trying actually to motivate these people to, to be engaged in real and practical support and yeah, it's also it gives us the opportunity, um, the fact that we are publishing the position of our Ukrainian comrades, it gives us the opportunity to show uh, to people, to the left wing uh, activists and trade unionists here that uh, the Ukrainian left exists and, and, it, and it's now it's fighting for also for our for our liberty here to to um, to continue actually to to fight for our for our um, uh, to defend our rights here, because uh, as we know, the Putin's regime is the 
best uh, supporter of the extreme right. And even here in Switzerland, the uh, right wing uh, uh, parties um, are not opposing the war in Ukraine and they are supporting Putin and his economical interests uh, in, in, in Switzerland. And it has a huge impact uh, on this war that Switzerland is not really engaged in 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 uh, in, uh, in real sanctions against the the Russian capital, and uh, the last thing I wanted to say that also the European um, the European uh, how to say uh, web the European uh, um, initiative of solidarity with Ukraine is uh, organizing a delegation that uh, would be able to go to Ukraine to meet our Ukrainian comrades to show our solidarity and also to help them financially in their initiatives that uh, where they are engaged to help workers uh, to defend their rights uh, right now in the war conditions. Uh, so I think we will um, we will uh, share more information on the social media when we have some practical stuff to 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 share with you. For example, we will raise uh, f- um, money uh, for this uh, for this uh, for this initiative for this mission. So uh, be be in touch and uh, with us and just check the social media and also social movements social network. They have their own bank account. So if you want to show the practical solidarity uh, with the left movement, please just donate something. And it counts a lot in in this period. And it counts a lot uh, in Ukraine. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you, Anna. So now there are many further questions we do not have the time to answer to all these questions but i would like to pick up two or three crucial questions which uh, are heavily discussed in the left uh, over have been discussed over the last five weeks or so um, one question is the question of sanctions uh, there are in the German left, for instance, there are different organizations which are argue heavily against sanctions because they say it's an inter-imperialist war and the sanctions are just one way to, to, to make the war. Right? It's a kind of economic war and therefore they are against sanctions. So what's the position of the, the Russian left on the question of sanctions. Probably for the Ukrainian left, uh, the question is easier. <laughs> but this this would be, uh, if you, Ilya, if you can try to do shortly to answer to this question, then I would add some further questions just after that, which are also heavily discussed in the German speaking world, but also in the French speaking world, as far as I know. Yeah, thank you. Uh, in fact, it's, uh, this is a very difficult question uh, for, uh, for the Russian left, uh, because uh, of course we can say that we support uh, absolutely those sanctions which, uh, which are against the Russian elite, uh, which are against the, the uh, oligarchs uh, and, and, and so on, and we do not oppose the uh, sanctions which uh, harm the, the population. But the fact is that it's very hard to define uh, one from the, uh, from the other. So, for example, the sanctions against the uh, Russian uh, corporations, uh, definitely they, uh, they harm the, uh, the elites. But uh, also, they uh, they uh, they are very painful for the thousands of workers who are losing their uh, their workplaces and uh, and so on. So uh, I I think that uh, the main uh, uh, the main um, point should be how we can stop this uh, war, uh, which is uh, which is destroying uh, Ukraine, but also destroying uh, destroying Russia uh, as well, and killing the future of the, uh, let's say, uh, most of Russians in one way or another. So uh, uh, 
Yeah, so <laughs> it, it, it's really hard for any uh, political uh, left-wing group in Russia to openly say yes uh, for the uh, sanctions. But uh, also we should understand that uh, if uh, the sanctions is the cost uh, that need to be paid to stop this war, so yeah, so probably uh, there, there is not so, uh, so much alternative to it. Yeah, so... Yeah, so I, 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 I have no any good uh, answer on this question, I will say. Mm -hmm. uh, the Ukraine, Ukrainian comrades, will is there some additional remark, a short remark to the sa sanction questions? I assume that uh, for you, the question is easier. <laughs> Otherwise, we skip that question for you. Uh, Okay, so uh, an important, oh, Gilbert, quickly. Yeah, <clears throat> just to say that uh, I, I fully understand <clears throat> what, uh, what Elia was just saying, and I, I, I said the, the same. That is, uh, it's very difficult for us to study those sanctions and say, this is a good one, this is not a good one. Mm -hmm. We don't have the means, so we have to be serious about that. Secondly, the governments, the Western governments, are fully engaged in imposing these sanctions. So I don't think it's our role to outbid them on that. Uh, and I don't have any confidence in the Boris Johnson government, in, in the, the Emmanuel Macron government, or all that. I'm, I'm sure they also use these issue of sanctions to, to pursue their own interests. So that's why the, my own position is, is that uh, uh, I mean, I'm not supporting these sanctions because I have zero confidence in the people. But at the same time, I understand that these sanctions are part of the pressure on Russia and therefore they are helping, definitely, certainly, no doubt, they are helping the Ukrainian resistance. And from that point of view, I'm against lifting those sanctions as long as the war is going on. When the war will finish, we'll see what happens. But then you have the problem of reparations to Ukraine because Russia has destroyed Ukraine. It must pay you know, a price for that. That's very normal, I would say, and legitimate. So that's another dimension of the problem. Uh, Gilbert, thank you for these additional uh, comments. Now I would come to two other uh, uh, points which are heavily discussed and controversially discussed within the left in, in, in our, our countries. The first is the question of the, the extreme right in Ukraine. Very often we can hear that, yes, the Ukraine is a country full of uh, right-wing extremists. There is an Azov battalion in, in Mariupol and uh, when we uh, support the armament of the Ukrainian army, finally, we, we will arm the extreme right. This is uh, one of the issues we have to discuss. Is there someone of you, Hanna, Dennis, uh, Maxim, who would like to answer to this uh, question? I can react, by, but my internet connection is now lagging. So do you hear me? Yes, yes, we do. Is anyone else wanting to, to answer? No. If on. not, then I will answer then after I'll you. proceed. Yeah, OK, do it. I think you, you you didn't hear that I said I will answer after you. But yeah, I can just give some, some arguments in saying that uh, it's uh, important to understand the uh, more war uh, lasts, the, the, the more it's going, war is going on, the more legitimacy the right wing uh, 
uh, battalions in Ukraine will have. We need to understand that the only the only reason why the right wing have its legitimacy in Ukraine is because the war uh, has started, and it has started because of the Russian invasion in 2014. So um, it it's the only source of 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 their of their existence and of their um, image of uh, kind of saviors in the in the in the in the Ukrainian society. But in fact, uh, I don't think we can uh, from I think it was said uh, maybe by the others, but maybe there are people who don't know know it, but the extreme right is not represented in the Ukrainian parliament in the Ukrainian uh, politics, institutional politics. It's, it has a very, very low scores, but it's present in the streets. It's present in the uh, in the army and uh, it's it's not a secret. And I think my Ukrainian comrades are facing uh, this problem every day, like daily. They are confronted from to this uh, to the extreme right uh, violence. But I don't I don't think uh, this is. Uh, I think we have a lot of fantasies about the real uh, power and the real influence of extreme uh, right in Ukraine and. Um, yeah, I think that the the most important thing to understand that they emerged and they gained their legitimacy in the population just because of the uh, Russian invasion. And I think Denise can have can have more insights about that. Can give us more insights. Yes, Denise, can you add some further insights? Maybe I can continue, and when the internet of Denis will be stable, he will <laughs> okay. join us. Uh, so uh, uh, we should actually differentiate the situation that was in 2014 after the uh, Maidan revolution and now in Ukraine, because a lot of people think the situation is totally the same. After the Maidan, there wasn't, there was no uh, a regular, uh, totally, almost no regular army in Ukraine, and the strict. Uh, um, constitution of the uh, Ukrainian forces. Therefore, in the east of Ukraine, almost all of these uh, units troops were composed of different volunteering groups. And yes, larger, largely at that time, it was different far right groups as uh, Azov or, you know, all of them. Uh, but uh, now the situation is totally another after the uh, elections of the when the Zelensky was elected. And uh, I am not a fan of presidency of Zelensky, but I should admit that uh, the power and the influence of far right groups was now a less, uh, more or less than that it was before. Even the Minister of Inter Internal Affairs that was supporting different far right groups after the protest of uh, Ukrainian population by the, was uh, rejected by the Ukrainian government. And now, as you know, uh, there is a Azov battalion, but uh, it is its uh, power, its influence is very exaggerated. It's uh, about less than 1,000 troops. Uh, it's, they are fighting in Mariupol and uh, almost of all the Ukrainian troops are regular army. And uh, as you know, the, uh, this defense unit on the local scale, they are composed of working people, of uh, different uh, activists. For example, we have also, also uh, defense units of uh, anarchists, of socialist uh, activists. And uh, you can find uh, a lot of different uh, trade unionists that also composed uh, their uh, so to say battalions and now are uh, supporting the Ukrainian resistance. Therefore, uh, I want to emphasize that this today Ukrainian resistance is very popular one. It's not composed of just the far right. It really uh, has uh, mm, it really represents the whole scale of population and different uh, opinions that dominate in it. Okay, thank you, Maxim. Now I would, uh, time is running. We come almost already to the end of this interesting conference, but I would like to add uh, one crucial question, 
which is uh, being discussed, also of course highly controversially discussed, and some uh, some participants, uh, some people from the audience, uh, raised uh, raised this question. There is the question of arms. One argument is that if uh, the Ukraine gets arms, that will prolongate the war. Because finally, it's impossible to win, to, get, to, to, to be victorious against the much stronger army of Russia. And if uh, the Western countries, the Western powers uh, deliver arms, it just prolongates the war and it will destroy the society, it will come into a, some kind of Syrian uh, situation. So that's one of the issues many people, of course, raise. Uh, I, th I think it's important that you, you answer to this, this argument. Uh, it's it's uh, heavily discussed. Yeah? in German left and other circumstances, and of course, also people right now raise this, this issue. Uh, will, is there someone who wants to, uh, re to give an answer of, to this uh, question? <laughs> I surely can do, but if someone else wants. Yeah, okay, uh, Silvia, go on, and pr probably afterwards, Dennis' uh, connection will be uh, again work. But go on. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's quite uh, clear. Uh, anyone saying, well, weapons should not be sent to the Ukrainians in order that the war does not, you know, carry on, that means what? That it means that you are wishing that they capitulate. That's exactly what it means. It means they should stop fighting. Well, I haven't heard much of such kind of argument when Vietnam was fighting US imperialism. And by the way, the US army in Vietnam was far bigger than the Russian army in Ukraine, right? And Vietnam was a smaller country than what Ukraine is today. And yet in the inflicted defeat upon US imperialism, but that also because it got weapons, it got a popular resistance. It, was, it got weapons from China and Russia, you know, and the Soviet Union. So, I mean, this is a, a, a fight going on and we have to support the Ukrainians in order even for them to negotiate. Because if to negotiate, you have to create a, 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 a position on the ground that allows you to get what you, you, you may regard as acceptable, as an acceptable compromise. Otherwise, the invader will impose all their conditions on you. So that's it. So those who say no weapons to the Ukrainian, they should be clear and say, we want the defeat of Ukraine and Russia's control of, of the country. Otherwise, if you don't want that, if you want to support the Ukrainian, if you believe that the Ukrainian resistance is a just war, a just fight, then you the only coherent position is it should be supported the right of the Ukrainians to get weapons for their defense from whichever source is available to them is a fully legitimate right. That's it. I think issues are quite clear. And, you know, I mean, pacifism, I would, I mean, I, I respect the pacifist position, nonviolent, turn the other cheek, you're okay. But that means what? Which country in the world has done this? Let, let them invade us and, 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 uh, and I mean, okay, that, that's a position. Maybe someone has it for religious reason. It's, it's respectable. But when you come through, you, you, you position that as a political position, sorry, but it's completely incoherent, right? And, and here, if the, the, the only thing again is really solidarity with the Ukrainian people uh, it's not because the Ukrainian people are not brown or black, but they are maybe fair haired, blonde. Th that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be supported. I mean, this is a view of the world where you only support uh, 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 fights in the global south against US imperialism and, and you, you don't support uh, people who are oppressed. And the Ukrainian people is oppressed. And we have heard a lot from, from our uh, Ukrainian uh, panelists uh, about that. So 
it is a clear, just struggle, and it must be supported without quarrels, right? Without, uh, the, without uh, uh, taboos and religious feelings. Yeah? And, uh, and uh, now the point is, and I want to finish with that, uh, I think Dennis mentioned that, the, the aftermath of this war is very important. Because indeed, what will happen in Ukraine, Ukraine will be watched uh, very closely. And, and, and here, the, the, the fight of the Ukrainian socialists against the, the Zelensky government and the, the, the attempts, I, I've read, just read the, a statement by, by Zelensky saying that uh, after the war, it won't be a liberal democracy, but there will be army everywhere. I mean, is this the, the future of Ukraine that you are promising? No. I mean, this, this has to be, to be fought. And again, our, our solidarity with, with Ukraine as a nation is also at the same time a solidarity uh, of our solidarity with the, with the, 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 the progressives in Ukraine uh, in their fight against their own government. Uh, thank you very much for this clarification. Now, Hanna would wants to add uh, some arguments uh, in this respect. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to, uh, to, to give uh, some thoughts about the fact that if uh, uh, those who are promoting and want to uh, want uh, Ukrainians and Russian uh, now to uh, make a ceasefire and, 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 and the, uh, to have a negotiations, uh, and to accept uh, to accept the revendication and demand of a Russian towards towards Ukraine, that means that they are um, they they must they must understand and they must know that the Russian revendication for Ukraine and the Russian demand for Ukraine it's so called uh, denazification, and we understood that denazification means de-Ukrainization, and also that means. Uh, Elimination, physical elimination of of uh, a very, uh, very large uh, group of the population, which are considered uh, being so called Nazis uh, by the uh, Russian government. So we must, if you are a pacifist in this situation, you must assume to say openly to Ukrainians, lay down your arms and be ready to be slaughtered because that's what the Russian uh, Russia proposes you. It doesn't propose any uh, uh, compromises uh, for, any, for, for this moment. And also you need to assume the disposition and to say also to our Russian comrades that they must surrender and uh, now they must live in a fas fascist and the totalitarian, quasi-totalitarian state and they must not oppose the, the, their government. That it's also, if you are defending <laughs> this position, you need to be ready to understand that after, uh, after the, uh, the end of, uh, of the war uh, in Ukraine, if, if Putin uh, stays in power, it means for Russian the end of, of their future. And it means for our Russian comrades, anti-war comrades, that they must they cannot continue to live in in this state they have uh, no future so this if, if you are um, going in till the end in your in your logic so this is the position you must assume mm -hmm. yes uh, thank you hannah for this very important additional uh, uh, remark so uh, when I saw it, see it correctly, Dennis would like to add uh, a, a comment on this. I'll issue. try if you hear me. Can yes, hear we me? can hear you. We can hear you. Go on. Okay, so yeah, I think that Gilbert uh, did a, like a brilliant um, uh, um, argument that uh, well actually we can compare this many people are familiar with organizing in the unions and without any power behind you you are crushed by the boss and this is a situation that uh, Ukraine without uh, military support will be uh, again crushed by the uh, stronger state and the stronger army and uh, think about it that um, in, in the case that um, uh, it fails uh, it, it will mean uh, additional Buchas and Mariupols 
because uh, this is the, the reality of the Russian occupation and uh, uh, the disastrous reality. Uh, and actually, uh, it will also set, uh, set this uh, dangerous precedent uh, when another great power uh, is uh, exerting its aggression without uh, obstacles and uh, it will uh, stir up uh, further aggression throughout the world of the likes of Erdogan and so on. And uh, actually uh, think about the Ukrainian people. Uh, Ukraine is uh, a, a periphery in Europe. It's uh, a, a, a country that isn't at the core of the uh, capitalist world system. It's uh, actually something that is closer to the global south. And uh, um, that's why we need uh, so desperately this solidarity, especially in the global south. Christian, on t'entend pas. Sorry, thanks. Just before we end, I would like to give uh, once for a short answer uh, to Ilya, a re, a short reply. There was one question on the future of Russia. What it's a little bit speculative, of course, but uh, in case the Putin regime could be uh, broken down, destroyed, what what could happen? What what kind of scenarios are, are possible? Could you give you as a very short answer? Because in our next conference, uh, within two weeks, we will also have uh, Simon Pirani, who is a very good specialist also on the economic issues uh, of Russia. But could you give us uh, some thoughts of, on the future of Russia as our last uh, point today? Uh, yeah, it's, it's in cases, uh, <laughs> it's very uh, speculative uh, question, but uh, one thing which is very clear uh, that uh, the current regime is the uh, regime that is very much based on the personal power of, uh, of one man. And uh, the, uh, let's say, disappearance of this uh, man in uh, one way or another will uh, change a lot will change a lot in the direction of the uh, country, in the mood of the Russian elites, uh, with, with the future of Ukraine as well. So that's the result of the development of this system in the last uh, 20 years. And I think that if something will happen with this uh, one person, <clears throat> the any kind of his uh, successor uh, will use uh, this um, in order to re-establish uh, some relations with the West. That is nearly for sure. But in what form it, uh, it will uh, come, it's really hard to, hard to predict. Yeah, and uh, of course, I, I believe uh, that the future on Russia uh, of Russia will lie uh, in the path of its, uh, let's say, democratization, uh, because uh, any refusal of uh, Putin's uh, legacy in the international arena also will uh, lead to the some kind of demontage of his. Uh, of his political uh, political system. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, for this short remark on possible futures. Now I would like to conclude uh, <clears throat> this conference. I'm very happy that you all part were with us, giving us your insights, your experiences. And I think it's just uh, a starting point of developing uh, future discussions, uh, really establish a shared uh, learning process between uh, left and socialists in Eastern Europe and, and Western Europe, what didn't take place over the last year, what is a, a huge uh, mistake, a huge deficit. And I think we, we should go on really uh, creating learning spaces, shared learning spaces to go on. Uh, I am happy that uh, 
uh, around in the middle of our conference, uh, more than 210 or 11, 12 uh, people participated on this conference. This is far more than I personally expected before. That shows that uh, it's really, uh, uh, many people are interested in, in exchanging experience and discussing. So I would like to make a short announcement of, on the next uh, conference. Because we were already aware that uh, it could be, uh, it, 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 um, many people are interested uh, in these debates, we will organize a second conference on April uh, 21, just a little bit more than uh, two weeks. Uh, the same time on, on 7 p.m. And we will have, uh, as I mentioned just before, uh, Simon Pirani. He is a lecturer at the university in, 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 in UK. He is a specialist in fossil energies and oil and, and gas industries. And he is a specialist also uh, on the economic situation in Eastern Europe. We will also have Yulia Yurchenko. She is uh, from Ukraine, a political economist. She also has published recently a book on the political economy of uh, of the Ukraine. She is the, she is also she, she teaches at, uh, at Greenwich University in London, and currently she is still in in Ukraine. We will hopefully have. Uh, um, Taras Bilus from uh, Social Neuruch, the social movement, comrade of Maxim and Dennis. And hopefully we'll also, we will also have Oksana Duchak uh, from the Commons Journal, also from Ukraine, who had uh, to leave the, the country. In the chat, uh, you have links, you can see links to different uh, activities of solidarity also in the questions and answer uh, uh, button, if you see that because there were several questions on how can we support what kind of activity we could we can support you see the links. We uh, from probably from so movement for socialism and the journal emancipation, we will put further activities on our websites and accounts where you can uh, send money to uh, and uh, we will hope we will uh, try to support uh, uh, yes solidarity activities in, in Switzerland and in Germany and Austria where we can. Uh, I thank uh, a huge thanks to the translators, the interpreters. It's uh, a huge effort. Uh, we translated in, in German, in um, Spanish, in Italian, and, and French. I'm also happy that uh, the journal Viento Sur, the, the Estado de España, uh, joined us with uh, in this meeting. And uh, hopefully also uh, the next meeting, which will take place in two weeks, we can also have further partner organizations uh, in Germany, in Austria and else Switzerland who participate to really engage this important exchange of experiences, ideas. So uh, thank you everybody, to the public, to the audience for participating. Uh, join our uh, look to our websites, Movement uh, for Socialism, which is uh, socialismus.ch or uh, uh, emancipation, emancipation.org or uh, vientosur.info uh, vientosur uh, uh, to inform yourself. And of course, uh, I do not know. Uh, we will. We can also put the website of uh, of um, Social Nidur, uh, social movement, and the Commons Journal um, from Ukraine uh, to our website. And as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, uh, Ilya is working with uh, uh, Left East and Open Open Left. Huh? Uh, oh no, how's, what's the name of, I forgot the name. 
so open left room. Yeah, yeah. Just, just, just to mention that for the moment, uh, you should uh, follow for the different projects of the Russian yeah. socialist uh, movement. Yeah. Okay. This which I'm a part of. They have also an English uh, part of their website. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I. The speakers can uh, hopefully you can stay some minutes with us just to make a short uh, to have a short feedback uh, round with uh, with us. But uh, thank you to everybody. Yeah. To, uh, so, and hopefully we'll we will see each other uh, within two weeks. <laughs>